Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. Recently, my wife and I watched uh, the Reacher series on Amazon Prime. And we'd watched the last year, and we'd watched uh, every episode uh, only at the end. In other words, after all of the episodes were up on Amazon, or Amazon Prime, we watched the whole thing. We sort of binge-watched it, which was very, very enjoyable. When we watched Reacher this year, we watched each individual episode as it came out. And the lag between times made it really difficult. And then, at the end, it was like, oh man, it was such a great story, and now we're at the end of it. You know, you kind of felt like you'd lost contact with a friend. Well, I wish we could say that uh, Attorney Smith and and uh, the prosecutors in this case uh, had created that kind of environment for us where we really will miss them, but we won't miss them. I don't think anybody's going to miss them because what they had to do, the dirty job that they had to do, was put all this evidence into the public record and let a jury of 12 people examine it, and that's exactly what they did. And I think the prosecution did an excellent job of getting the evidence in, and I think the defense did an excellent job with, the, with what they had to work with of questioning the quality of the witnesses and the quality of the testimony as it came in. And now we're down to closing arguments. They did closing arguments yesterday, and I've pulled out a couple of things that I want to talk about. First thing I want to talk about is that New Hampshire apparently does it much different than most other jurisdictions. In Missouri, for example... In a closing argument situation, whether it's a civil trial or a criminal trial, the plaintiff, or in this case the prosecutor, goes first. The defense gets to get up and say whatever it needs to say about what the prosecution said. And then the prosecution gets to go up one more time and rebut anything that it believes that the defendant said that hurt its case. That's the way it's always done, and in fact, that's the order that the evidence comes in. Prosecution puts on its case in chief. Defense puts on its case in chief. The prosecution gets a chance to put on rebuttal witnesses, and then they do that through the closing. You know, prosecution, defense, prosecution. That isn't the way it's done in New Hampshire, however. In New Hampshire, the process is the plaintiff begins, or in this case, the prosecution begins the trial with opening argument, and the defense follows. And then at the close of the trial, the defense has to go first, and then the prosecution does its closing. Now that puts the defense at a huge tactical disadvantage because it has no way to respond to what the state is going to say. It doesn't know what the state is going to say, and as a result, it's really going to have to horribleize and anticipate all the stuff that the state is going to say and come up with some kind of an argument to defeat that. I think the prosecution did a great job in this case of positioning the evidence, and in the initial part of the closing arguments here, I think the defense did as good a job as they could do in this kind of awful case. One of the first things that happens is they talk about some of the things that Adam said when he found out that Harmony was no longer with us. And the, it's very well done here by the defense counsel, but it's going to come back and bite them when the state closes. Wake up, baby girl. Baby girl, wake up. Those were the words that T Kayla used to describe how Adam approached his child when he discovered that she was dead. Kayla used words that were the truth sometimes to fill in her lies. Baby girl, wake up. Those words were from a real memory of how Adam was speaking when he discovered his daughter looking peacefully asleep would never wake up again. Wake up, baby girl. But she didn't. Those words were the truth surrounded by Kayla's lie. Adam is no innocent. 
shortly after he discovered that his baby girl would not wake up again, he began a series of decisions, terrible and criminal decisions. He made them with a very misguided belief that he had to make them to keep his family from being ripped apart. And he made those decisions with the input and influence of his wife, Kayla. He did make those choices, and you will hold him accountable for those choices. He and Kayla hid, moved, lied, and manipulated Harmony's body after her death. It's unforgivable. They lied about her whereabouts after her death, and it's unforgivable. But he did not do this to hide that he killed Harmony, because he did not kill Harmony. He did this because he believed it would keep his family together. That's a fairly good opening gambit, but and it does show, you know, a softer side of Adam Montgomery, assuming that there actually is a softer side of Adam Montgomery. From the evidence that's come in in the case, that's a little hard to believe, but okay, you know, suspend disbelief for a little bit and think about it. Yeah, I mean, it could, he could have said that, and uh, apparently Kayla said that he did say that, but I don't believe he really expected Harmony to wake up. And I think you'll find that this is an interesting, uh, an interesting juxtaposition for what the state's going to say here in a minute. But let's continue with the defense closing. Because she said, after witnessing these beatings, she said, I'm hungry. Let's go to Burger King. And Adam drove to Burger King. And on the way, she said Harmony was crying a lot and making a weird noise. And Adam got really angry and kept punching, punching her and said, Stop. And then he hit her at the traffic lights. Two, maybe three traffic lights, she said, coming over the seat and pummeling her in the back. Not in secret, not hidden, broad daylight on a busy street with busy traffic stopped at a stoplight. And then she said she put up an arm to stop him. She doesn't mention any effort to try and stop those horrific acts beforehand. No effort on her part. But somehow or other, at this point, she thinks this is enough and puts her arm up. And what does she say he does? He gives her a look, a crazy look, like evil. It's the first time she had seen that. And she felt like he might hit her. So she didn't do anything. One of the problems for me is that once I've heard an argument, I can always think of a better one. And it's not fair to this defense counsel to suggest that there are better arguments to make. But I think essentially what she's trying to get across here is that Kayla Montgomery is not reacting and thinking the way a mom would. She is thinking the way a drug addict would. She's got two other children in the seat of the car, in the back seat of the car, and they're not getting beaten, but they're wit they're witnessing all of this, and that can't possibly be good for them. She's basically just throwing shade at Kayla here. In this next section here, what's going to happen is fairly simple. She is going to cast aspersions as to the veracity of the recounting of the incident, the timing of Harmony's death, and the fact that this is the plan to cover that death up. She has very little to work with here in terms of evidence, but she's doing the best she can with what she has. When they were at that intersection, she didn't collapse with, oh my God, it's up, finally. She's waving cars around, she's cool, she's calm, she's getting the kids out, why? Because that wasn't when Harmony died. In that intersection, Harmony was already dead, and a plan had already been set for what to do. They had talked for hours before that intersection. They knew what they were going to do. 
And that car breaking down at that intersection certainly put a, a ruined those plans. And she said uh, he had had blood on his hands from striking Harmony and giving Harmony a bloody nose. She assumed that that's what he was wiping up. And uh, the police officer said, wait a minute. I haven't heard about blood before. What's this? She gets discovery. She knows that they found the car. She knows that there's no blood in the car. So she walks it back. And she says, no, not that day. Um, it was, he was cleaned up. And uh, it was from a bloody nose from an earlier beating a few days before. So no, there was no blood in the car that day. And I started questioning her a little bit more. And um, so are you saying you saw no blood that day? And she said, well, there was dried blood on uh, Harmony's face. And I said, so there was blood that day. And she said, no, that was from the days before that we talked about. Okay, well, one of the things that you learned about Blue Star is it wouldn't have mattered whether it was a few days before December 7th or December 7th. It wouldn't have mattered if he had him, had tried to wipe up blood Blue Star would have found it. When I was a little kid, one of my aunts was particularly bad about cooking fried foods, and almost every piece of meat that she cooked, because she believed in meat being very well done, um, there, the outside edges of it sometimes approached the quality of having been incinerated. And I would always complain about that because I just could not stand the taste of anything that tasted like charcoal. You know, for me, charcoal belonged out in the barbecue grill, not in the, on my plate. Uh, but my aunt would tell me to just eat the part that wasn't burned, or what I thought was burned. She always said it was brown, but she said, just eat the part that's not burned. Well, in effect, that's what defense counsel is doing here. The majority of the meat here, of meat of... of Kayla's testimony is pretty good. But there are some inconsistencies in it. There are some things that she had to walk back and backtrack on. There are numerous statements, and any time you have numerous statements, you have differences between them, and any attorney who graduated from law school is going to be able to pick those apart and call them out. The question is just whether you believe the explanations that are offered for that. And also, whether or not it's actually relevant on anything that is material with respect to the case. I'm not sure it was particularly effective in, it's because it's not that material, but it was a good example of how a lawyer can pick apart testimony with prior inconsistent statements. Now our defense counsel is going to make a plea that the jury act on the evidence and not on their emotions. And she's going to tell them, you know, if you, if you act on your emotions, it's going to be a quick verdict. But if you honor your oath and take time and go through all the evidence, well, you'll find that, you know, there's a lot to not believe in Kayla's testimony. Whether or not that's an effective approach, we'll find out at the end. But here's what she says. If you rely on anger, if you rely on horror, because what Adam did, what he did do to Harmony's body after she died is horrific. What he did do by allowing that entire investigation to go for so long can make you very, very angry. And if you decide this case based on your emotions, it can be a quick verdict because none of those emotions will be positive. But if you take the time you take a breath and you go through the evidence piece by piece, evaluate, talk to each other. What do you think about her testimony? Some of you will remember things different from others. Talk it out. What was correct? Some of you might remember things different from what I said. I'm human. But talk it out. What is right here? What is there? What is missing? What is crazy? What is that? If you do that, 
this is a very, very difficult case because those emotions are there. If you do that, if you put it aside, you will find that it's not guilty of murdering this brother. He did not do that. And he's not guilty of witness tampering. He didn't influence her testimony at all. It was in her best interest. A lie, to hide, and to make up more lies is time than long. Because the truth hurts. Has the state proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt? Do you know, in your heart of hearts, do you know not that this decision seems to make you feel good. Do you know that it is right? Do you know if they have met their burden? There's any doubt. We're not talking Indians. We're not talking crazy stuff. We are talking about trusting Kayla. If there is a doubt, a reasonable doubt, there is a reasonable doubt to not trust Kayla with any important decision. If you have that doubt, you must find not And now it's the state's turn. The state gets to get up and tell the jury what they need to know in order to convict Adam Montgomery. And they start by essentially attacking the defense counsel. Now, I think this thing about taking turns that he's going to say is kind of petty and it's an, a, a nonsensical slap at the other lawyer because it isn't about, you know, being about taking turns and, and that sort of thing. It's really about fundamental fairness. But he has to minimize the impact of what she says. So, unfortunately, he takes the position of demeaning the lawyer. And I think that's never a good thing to do for anybody in court. Um, the one time that, that I took that approach... I think it probably backfired on me. But let's take a listen to what he says. And I'm going to have to mute some of this because um, he's using a word that will essentially get this demonetized, which I'd rather not have happen. Good morning again, everyone. I want to thank you very much for the time that you have spent in this case for a journey that we told you back before we took the view was going to be a journey that you weren't going to forget. It has been a long couple of weeks. You have been incredibly attentive, and we are very, very appreciative of that. One of the things you heard just a moment ago from Attorney Smith was that she doesn't get the opportunity to come back up here and talk again. That's true. It's called taking turns. It's something that parents teach children. Beginning, state has to go first. Defendant has to go second. At the closings, defendant has to go first. State has to go second. Something very simple that parents teach children. One of the other things that they should teach is if you're going to quote the defendant, if you're going to quote a witness, you have to make sure that you're accurate. So I'll apologize in advance, but let's quote people accurately. I f up. Again and again and again. I f up. I f up. That's what the defendant, his language, that he used when he told Travis Beach at the night he got the U-Haul, the night that he disappeared Harmony's body, to whatever place it is now, where he knows it is right now, to this day, his words, I f not she, not we, not Kayla, I. Singular, personal, solo. One of the things that's really important when you're doing a closing argument and you're talking to people is that it's okay to be a little bit angry, but you can't come off like you're rabid. You have to come off like you are upset, you're angry for what happened to this victim, and you want to get justice for the victim. I think he's doing an excellent job here. He's coming across as these are the things that they say, but you know, we know better and the evidence shows you better. It's it's a good approach and a good start. And using Adam Montgomery's words in much the same way that the defense 
used Adam Montgomery's words, that was a good thing. I think he could have left off the little slap at the council, but everything else he did pretty well. And we'll start first with what the defendant's telling you in opening arguments, and now that you can and should find him guilty of abuse of a corpse and falsifying physical evidence. Let's set that as the baseline. Let's start there. Let's see what that actually means before we look at how he committed every up, each one of the crimes charged, not just the ones that he feels are going to distract you from the rest of the nightmare that he's responsible for. Who carried Harmony's body away from the broken down car in the duffel bag, hid her outside a colonial village while they stayed in Anthony Badero's blue Audi for two nights, put Harmony under a ramp and then in a van, and then in this cooler for weeks at Christina Lubin's house, into the CMC bag, into the walk-in cooler at Portland Pie Company, in the fridge, in the freezer, defrosted her in the shower, consolidated her body yet again brought her to the Econo Lodge, tricked his friend into renting him the U-Haul, and then dumped her body somewhere. All to make sure that the evidence that could have been brought before you that shows that he's responsible for having murdered her would never be found. And he says you can and should find him guilty of those two crimes. In this segment, he goes back to the def defense counsel's opening statement and reminds the jury that, hey, you know, he's already said that he's guilty of these crimes, but then he goes to the point of why they did that and exposes their strategy. Five pounds. And you heard from all those witnesses, especially Kayla, about why he beat Harmony to death, when he beat Harmony, and how he beat Harmony, and you vetted what she had to say. And you saw the rest of the injuries that he incurred, that he incurred and all of that was corroborated by the other evidence pr presented corroborated in ways that we'll explore that the witness never could have possibly known there was other evidence out there that supported them. Not when the defendant started telling investigators what happened and how the defendant beat the life out of Harmony. And then beat and manipulated and controlled Kayla afterwards to make sure that she stuck to the story so he would not be held accountable and the evidence of his crimes would not be found. Those Prosecutors have to be careful about using really graphic images when they are uh, doing closing argument. They have to be careful about introducing them into evidence because sometimes they're much more prejudicial than probative. But in this particular case, instead of relying on his rhetoric in closing this case, Instead, he puts up a picture of Kayla with her bruised face. Without having to say a word, he communicates to the jury that there's a really good reason why Kayla kept her mouth shut for so long. She was clearly afraid of Adam Montgomery. So, again, he's doing an excellent job here. Now let's move to the end of this and listen to how he closes his closing, basically asking for the verdict or telling the the jury essentially that they have an obligation to render this verdict if they're going to honor their oath that they took. Again, sort of taking the wind out of the sails of the defense when they talked about don't make a decision on the basis of emotion. But this is an especially effective closing argument. Descriptions. Descriptions suggested to you, maybe, evil. But don't call him a father. It's time now for you to hear the court's final instructions, to then go back into that room and deliberate all the evidence that you've seen, and to hold the defendant responsible for everything he did in July of 2019, in December of 2019, and afterwards. You promised both parties in the court during jury selection that when proof had been shown beyond a reasonable doubt of all of the elements of the crimes that you could and would hold the defendant responsible. And now, not all doubt, but all reasonable doubt. And that proof has been shown. You promised us during jury selection that you did that, and you would do that, and you saw Kayla testify. From that alone, you've got sufficient evidence to convict him of every charge, but you don't have to take her word for it because we've just talked about and you've seen for two weeks 
all of the evidence that corroborates and gives you what you need to find him guilty on each and every single one of these charges. We saw in this Kayla courtroom that Kayla is not lying about who hit Harmony. And there is no doubt about how Harmony was hurt in July, who killed her in December, what was done to her body and who did it, who falsified physical evidence, and how the defendant kept Kayla quiet. He's guilty of second degree murder for recklessly causing Harmony's death with extreme indifference to the value of life because you've seen beyond even that standard, he had complete indifference to the value of her your life. Kayla did nothing. He did a lot of things. He did something, he said. It's called murder. It's called assault. And he's guilty of every single one of those charges in front of you. And so I ask you to hold him responsible for that truth in what you've seen in the facts, what you've seen, what you've tested, and what you've heard has been proven. Find him accountable and find him guilty on every single one of these charges. And I thank you so much for your time. Because of the positioning of how these closings were done with the defense going first and then the state, I think the state has a tremendous advantage here. I was actually kind of surprised we didn't get a verdict yesterday, but I'm pretty sure we will get a verdict today. I would doubt that they would be out particularly long on this. The evidence seems fairly overwhelming, but again, there are a lot of things that are inconsistent, and they may take longer trying to get consensus in this case. So that also is something to consider. Again, this was a very tough case for the defense. I think they've done an admirable job. I just don't think, in my own opinion, that it was done quite as well as the state. I think the state attorneys have done very, very well in presenting this case. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Please do something kind for somebody today and catch me back here at the beach again next time. I try very hard not to be like all those other YouTubers who open up every video by asking you to subscribe before you've even seen the content. But now that you've gone a few minutes into the content, if you find this interesting and helpful, please subscribe. I'd consider it a personal favor. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.